Let me just read, and I won't give you much literary context because you've gotten enough of that. I think you have this passage memorized quite well, so I'll jump right into verse 14. Well, let me go into um, verse 13. Here's God speaking again. He sang to Solomon after Solomon prayed, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Here's what he says in verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I need you all to repeat after me. Repeat after me. Say, say, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, it says, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, I pray f- my prayer for you is that you reestablish a praying relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, turn to the other neighbor and say, other neighbor, my prayer for you is that you start praying to God. Amen, amen, amen. That's, 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 um, I've been telling you all every week, uh, you know, I, I've been saved for a long, 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 long time, right? And every time I open the Bible, Pastor Mason, I don't know, Bishop, I don't know if this is your issue. Every time I open the Bible, it's like God speaks afresh, right? And he shows you, you again, and then there's this sense of, man, I need to grow more. I need to be more of who God would have me to be. And so this week for me has been like, man, dang, here we go again, right? Because uh, I want to love God like that. I want to be more of what God would have us to be. So I'm going to jump right into the teaching and just kind of talk to it. Here's a quote that I want to start off with. You guys have all heard this, right? Everybody has heard this. Um, it's not what you know, but y'all know that, right? Everybody have heard that. And you've used it in varying contexts. You've used it in many places. You've used it in your going and coming. I want to, I want to challenge us to kind of see this, that little phrase today through the lens of what I'll be talking about this morning as it relates to our spiritual journey with God. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Because a lot of us know a lot of things, but we might not know the right person. <laughs> you kind of get where I'm going? So I want to talk through that a little bit. It's not, it's not so much what you know, but it's who you know. So I have a lot of slides I want to talk through. Here's what um, one author kind of puts it this way. Prayer, I want to talk about prayer because prayer changes things. Prayer is the addressing and the petitioning of God. Just jumping right into this, right? It's an offering up of our desires unto him for things agreeable. And don't miss that phrase. You'll hear this a lot today. To his will, in the name of Christ, with confession of sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Here's what I've been teaching you for the past couple of weeks, right? It takes a high level of humility when we talk about humbling ourselves. And the last week we talked about the whole issue of pursuing God by seeking his face. Those are very, very essential to getting to God, to hearing what God has in store for us, and more, more importantly, encountering God. But our, most of us, when we de- define prayer, we see it as me. Well, this is, this is my, our prayer life, right? It's all me going that way to God, and it's never this way down to me. Does this make sense? So here's what my prayer time looked like. I get in my closet, and I say, God, be quiet. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes. And then when I get done, we're cool. Can we be honest this morning? Because very few of us go into a prayer closet and don't say anything and allow God room to speak. (laughs) Because for us, prayer is just like Aladdin. We rub the cosmic bottle and we offer up our wishes and we wait for the genie to come out of the bottle and grant us our wish. And that's the extent of what prayer means to us. Come on, y'all. Can we talk this morning? I want to challenge us a little differently this morning to see prayer through a completely different lens as you walk through this. Look at this. Biblical prayer is characterized, watch this carefully. This is Walter Enwell, right, in the Tyndale Bible Dictionary, that there is a distance between the creator and the creature 
due to human sin, and in today's day, it's bridged only by the grace of God. So this is what I've learned in my preparation this week, that there's a gap that exists between God and I, and then what prayer does is it helps bridge the gap because it's so wide, right? And what's deep about this, um, you all know this, we serve a transcendent God that sits high. This is how grandma them used to say, he sits high and he looks low, right? He's transcendent, yet he's eminent. He's far, yet he's near. But, but, but we have a messed up relationship with him. And so when we look at the Bible as it relates to prayer, it's not so much me always offering up stuff to God and hoping that God grants my request or do what I want done. A lot of time, it's a dialogue or communication between God and us. When you look at the prayer that we've been studying for the past couple of weeks, Solomon finished the work on the temple. And you'll notice he offered a prayer of dedication. And then you'll notice in chapter 7, verse 1, Solomon is silent and God speaks. Right? Right? And the whole passage that we've been studying in Chronicles 7, um, 13 through 15, is not Solomon talking. It is God talking back to Solomon in response to his prayer. When was the last time you heard God in your prayer chamber? And then his response was in response to what you just prayed. Let, let, me, let me help you all with this. This is going to make sense. Solomon saying, Lord, when the people sin, and they will sin, when they find themselves defeated, and he says, and when you withhold the pestilence, and when you send the locusts, and when you do all the stuff, he's saying to God, God, if they can only get their eyes on the temple, then here's what I want you to do. Forgive them. And then some time goes by, and then comes back, and God says to Solomon, hey, bro, I got you. I heard you. So here's what I'm going to do. And you don't see Solomon saying, God, be quiet. It's my turn to talk. <laughs> he's be silent, and he's allowing God to speak. So let me paint a picture here. Notice this. In the Old Testament, when the Bible began, this was the most convicting thing to me. It's stuff that we all knew as it relates to prayer. Humans were made for fellowship with God, and we lived in close communion with him. You know this, right? Genesis 3 and 8. I'll, I'll talk about this in a little while. And then secondly, notice this. When sin was introduced in the Garden of Eden, that fellowship and direct relationship with God was broken. Now, I did that too quick. Let me paint a picture. When you read Genesis chapter 1, God created Adam, God created Eve. And I want, it's very, very important for you to see what prayer looked like in Genesis 1 to 3 up until the fall. Okay? So... God in his transcendence would be far away. He'd create man, place him in the Garden of Eden and allowed him to live. And then in his eminence, in the cool of the day, in Genesis chapter 3, he would come down and he'd say, hey, Adam, how's your day? And Adam would say it was good. And then he'd say, hey, Eve, how's your day? And say, it was good. We had a good day. We ate from the fruit of the garden. It was so cool to work and not sweat. God, you're just the best. And he's like, I just love y'all. So, Because I just wanted fellowship. And I just need somebody to hang out with. So I created y'all. And man, y'all just the coolest thing. You guys just talk to me. All right, I'm going to let you be, all right? And then it's transcendence and he go away again. And Adam and Eve would sit there and say, wasn't that so cool? We're talking to God. We have communion with God. Notice the words I'm using. Then his transcendence again, he'd come back the next day in the cool and he'd talk to them and they would talk back to him. And listen to this, that was their prayer life. It was a conversation with God. You can't get what I'm saying? Very, very important for you not to miss that because if you don't get that data, you would think they had to do like we're doing today. See, the problem with me in my interpretation of biblical passage is I overlay on the text my current cultural context and I fool myself into thinking that's how it always was. God's design was that he come down and fellowship and commune and that was prayer. I hope you're seeing this. You kind of get where I'm going with this. I'm hoping that you're seeing this. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. And listen to the words I'm going to use. It was based on relationship. 
Here's it. It wasn't what they knew. It was, oh, y'all know this. Yeah, yeah. And they had a strong relationship with him. The problem was when God in his transcendence went away, okay, and Adam and Eve were let, left to their own um, self, the enemy now comes and he shows up and he tries to engage them in the same dialogue and he causes them to sin. Okay, now here's the important thing that I want you to understand. Subsequent to them sinning, subsequent to the fall, I need you to read the Bible very, very close. God seemed to keep his distance because he couldn't stand the presence of sin. So something was messed up. He's not coming down every day saying, Adam, what's up? Matter of fact, after they sinned, he did that once. Hey, Adam, how's your day? Adam? Adam? Hey, Adam. And here's Adam, as if God can't see. I heard you, the sound of you in the garden. And I hid because I was naked. And here's God. In all our communion and fellowship, we never use that word. <laughs> Where, where'd, you get, where'd you get that? Right? And then here's what they said. Well, the enemy came on Satan. We talked about that a while. Deceived us and we sinned so on and so forth. And God in his graciousness, to make a long story short, kills the lamb. He covers them. And then he goes away. And then it's very, very important for you to notice, he stays away. And listen to this. From Genesis 4 onward, mankind is left on the earth to their own devices absent God. No dialogue. No communication. No conversation. But the whole time God is looking because he misses the fellowship and the relationship with mankind. But look at what man does absent God. They go about living this evil, licentious, devious life, so on and so forth, such that God in his transcendence sits in heaven and he says, man, I'm going to have to start over because I don't know what went wrong. I'm going to wipe them all out. But wait, 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 there's one. And he saw, uh, what's his name? Oh, y'all know it. Good. Y'all know it. So y'all know this stuff. He found favor. You kind of get where I'm going? All right. But now notice this. Very, 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 very important for you to know. He found favor and grace in Noah's eyes. Now let me fast forward. Please understand with me. It was not until God encountered Abraham and reestablished the relationship with Abraham that he put a covenant in place, listen to this, to give man permission to now approach him again. You got to read the text, okay? Up until that time, he stayed where he was, right? Then now he establishes this covenant and he Bridges a gap, and he makes a way for them to have relationship with him. But I need you to notice this, and please study this on you. My wife and I were dialoguing about this. In all of Deuteronomy, in all of the Old Testament, there's not very many places where the people themselves are encouraged to pray to God. It's normally an intermediary, an intercessor, or a leader that is now praying to God on behalf of the people because the relationship has been broken and it's been tainted. Okay, y'all don't believe me yet. Remember when God came down, he was talking to Moses, and the people heard him, how they ran and hid. Oh, Moses, we don't want to talk to him. You talk to him for us. They were afraid to engage him in dialogue. Y'all remember that, right? Come on, say it was broken. Say it again, it was broken. The relationship was messed up. And so in the Old Testament, you see all this stuff going on, right? There was the establishment of the covenant with Abraham to now reestablish a relationship with God and humans because God's design is that he have with humans, I'm going to sound like a broken record, what he had in the book of Genesis with um, Adam and Eve. He, that's his goal is to get back there. So then in the Old Testament, this means that an uh, individual's approach to God in prayer is, 
was never simply man's search for God. In other words, by default, we weren't intended. We, by default, we don't naturally pursue God. God pursued us because his intent was for us to be in relationship with him. You kind of get what I'm saying? We're sinners. We're sinners by default. So by our natural state is not to pursue a holy God. So he puts this covenant in place so that he can come and have relationship with us, and he sets the initiative to make this happen. That's Old Testament. It's all about God initiating, all about God initiating, all about God initiating, all about God initiating. I'm going to say it again. All about God initiating, all about God initiating. So here's what happened in the judges. They would sin, and he would send. You kind of get what I'm saying? If you look at all the major prophets and the minor prophets, the people would sin, and he would send. They, They would mess up, and he would do something to bring them back in relationship, they in and of themselves, did ne- they never initiated the restoration process between mankind and God. They didn't have capacity to do that. Jesus comes on the scene. I'm going fast. New Testament creates a new paradigm. God incarnate, right? God in flesh. And if you look at the New Testament, it's all about something different that never happened in the Old Testament, Everything Jesus does, he prays to the Father first. He talks to his daddy. Hey, daddy, I do nothing except I see what my father does. And if you look at all his miracles, if you look at everything he does in the Old Testament, it's preceded by this interesting term called prayer. Okay? Where he now, from the earth's perspective, lock into this, from earth, he is initiating Old Testament is always God initiating, right? Now Jesus comes and from earth, he's initiating with the dad, with his father. He's going up to daddy. So here's what prayer looks like, right? Prayer then, from Jesus' perspective, is an expression of sincere, sincere desire. Very, very important for you not to miss this. Prayer is not to inform God, God of matters that he would otherwise be ignorant of. Because that's how some of us pray. God, I don't know if you know this. But I thought I'd let you know. (laughs) And we fool ourselves into thinking that we've got secrets that God doesn't know. And when we go to prayer, have you heard lately, God? Yeah. (laughs) What's going on, right? So there's nothing informative about our prayers to God. He knows everything. So look at what he does in the New Testament, right? In Matthew when he does the Lord's Prayer. A source of teaching of the Lord's Prayer. Once again, notice the blend of the directness. Our Father, and notice the distance who art in heaven. At that point in time, he's still transcendent. You kind of get what I'm saying? Hallowed be your name. And the requests then in the Lord's Prayer are concerned first with God, him first, his kingdom first, his glory first, right? Then the needs of the disciple, forgiveness, daily support, deliverance, all that good stuff that they would need. But it begins with God then it comes down to us. So now when you get to Paul, this is, this is the shift. So I did that very, very fast, and we'll flesh it out Wednesday. Jesus comes, and Jesus now from the earth initiates that way. In the Old Testament, when we sin, it's God from heaven initiating that way because we don't have capacity to initiate that way. Does this make sense? Okay, so Jesus comes, he dies on the cross, he returns back to his father, he sends this person called the Holy Spirit as our comforter, and Paul now, in all of his writing, and we don't have time to go to these texts, we're going to do this Wednesday night, it is in Paul's writing that the theology of prayer, I love this, is mostly fully developed. Notice this now, in the New Testament, the believer is a son that's neutral gender, not only a servant. That's a shout right there, if you get what I'm saying. Okay, completely different paradigm. Jesus was the what? Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who had ability to initiate from the earth to heaven, and God could speak down. Jesus dies, and now he makes you, and he makes me sons and daughters of him. So here's what happens at the onset of the the Pauline epistles, even after the death of Christ. We have the ability to, I wish I had somebody... Yeah, you got to get that. 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 So, so here's what that means. 
The pursuit of relationship now is not unidirectional where it is God always pursuing us. He deposits something in you and he deposits something in me that looks like him, that sounds like him, that feels like him, that talks like him, come on, that behaves like him, that sounds like him, such that when we find ourselves distant, he's not the only one with the ability to miss us. We have now the ability to miss. I wish I had somebody in here. We can miss him because he dwells in us. Ha! If you get that, your prayer life will change because you pray for him as if, as if, as if he's the only one missed you and he has something. I mean, you, you just, we only pray because we need something from here. Prayer ought to be, Daddy, I miss you. And leave it at that. But no, we want, Lord, it's a, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, kingdom of me. Good, good, got that out of the way. God, here's why I'm really here. <laughs> Can we be honest about this morning? We don't miss him like that. We miss what we had. We miss our stuff. I got her. I'm about to lose a house, so I'm going to pray real quick. I'm about to lose a job, so I'm going to pray. I wish I had somebody in here. I'm going to pray real quick. I'm about to lose my spouse, so I'm going to pray real quick. I'm about, come on. And the only sole purpose of our prayer is doesn't look nothing like the Garden of Eden, but it looked like everything fleshly, everything worldly, and we call that prayer? It's unidirectional. Because we have access to God, we see it as a license to rub the lamp. And that's all we do. We have a Will Smith, Aladdin moment. When we come to prayer, it's like we go in our closet and, and the lamp looks really good. It's got pages. And we grab that thing. I'm about to pray, Jesus. Tell me I'm lying. Because it's about me. It's not about the relationship. We approach God like we do our spouses, men, such that they know when we want something. They just kind of, what you want? <laughs> Before we even get to it. Right? Does this make sense? Very, very important that we not miss this, okay? So, so look at this. So prayer, here's what prayer does for us. It's part of our armor against the satanic attack. The effective ministry of the word of God depends on prayer of God's people. The Christian is encouraged to pray for what? All sorts of things. And I'll talk about that in a little while. I'm almost there. With thanksgiving. So then you might be asking me, okay, God, okay, preacher. So then why does God answer some prayers and not others? And more fundamentally, how is God able to answer any prayer at all? I got an answer for that one. It took me a week to come up with this. When it comes to prayer, it's not what you know. Yeah. I was in Washington, D.C. I told you about my granddaughter last week, right? I had a chance to see that little booger. I was in D.C. with her this past week. And um, their dad... Um, we went to conduct business, and uh, I took my wife, and um, first thing we did was got from the plane, went to their house, and we picked up the grandkids and took them to our hotel room. And their dad said, don't spend no money on them. And they kind of looked at their dad. <laughs> he don't know who we know. <laughs> you get it? You get it? You get it, right? You got to go to the site? Dad's like, don't spend no money on them. And so I made the mistake of staying in the room to get some study in. And Pascatani took the kids and they went shopping. And, <laughs> yeah. And the first grandkid came back. They all came in the room. And the middle boy, I kid you not, these were the exact words that came out of his mouth. Grandpa, we killed Grandma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> Those were the exact words out of his mouth. And he starts to tell me how much money she spent on each child. Really, really, she really did. He, I mean, they laid it out. And at the end of the week, 
the oldest boy, he had a wad of cash. And I'm like, Jeremiah, where you get that from? Yeah, Grandma hooked the brother up, you know. <laughs> and I said to Grandma, Grandma, why you give that boy money? And he says, well, he was smart enough to get the cheapest gift and get the rest of his in cash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she said, bro, these little boogers are like, you kind of get what I'm saying? You, you, kinda, you, you, get, you, get, you get what I'm saying. But the point of the illustration is this, is they know Grandma. They were happy that grandpa stayed in the room. They really were. They know grandma, and they know that if they can get next to grandma and rub her legs and tell her how well her bacon and pancakes are and tell her what a beautiful grandmother she is and how lovely she is, that there would be no need that they would have that she wouldn't. I wish I had somebody. Yeah. Those little boogers understood the importance of relationship. Yeah. You kind of get where I'm going? They, they, knew, they knew not to show up and just the first thing they're going to do is ask her for stuff because they knew they would alert her to certain things. But if they can have her in that feel-good moment, I wish I had somebody in here where she's embellishing in their love for her. And more importantly, listen to this, she doesn't have to initiate. They're initiating, telling her how much she, they love her. Telling her, I wish I had somebody in here, how gracious she is and what a good grandma. She, I, mean, I mean, the whole weekend, when we got back on the plane, she kind of looked at me like, what you going to say? You know, <laughs> like expecting me to act like them. You kind of get where I'm going? But, but the point was they understood the importance of relationship and dwelling on that relationship because out of the relationship, provision existed. And man, if we can ever figure that out about prayer, I think a lot of us will get more prayer answered, Right? So let me go through a couple of things, and then we'll wrap this up, right? So watch this. So prayer then involves a personal relationship with God. You want to go back to Eden. And because prayer involves a personal relationship with God, sincerity, we talked about this a couple of weeks before. This is why I had to do this up front. Sincerity and uneffectiveness in that relationship are of paramount importance. In other words, you can't fake it with God. Been living raggedy. Let me just get down to earth all week long. And then going to come and huddle up to him. As if he didn't know you've been living raggedy. I wish I had somebody. Been, 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 been being a bad child. Let me just be nice. A bad child. Then all of a sudden, because you have need, you want to tell him how lovely he is. Motives are wrong. Right? Humble themselves. Remember that phrase? Humble themselves and then seek my face. Seek my face is not only when we have need, but it's a constant pursual. It's a constant going after in my walk, in my talk, in my sleep, in everything I do. It's not about me. It's not only when I find myself in crisis, but when things are going good, it's all about God. When I'm being blessed, it's all about God in the good times. It's all about God in the bad times. It's all about God. So here's what he says when we come. There's a child after my own heart. They're not faking it. Sincerity is very, very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. If one of those grandchildren were bad over the years and their dad said they don't deserve nothing because they were being bad, guess what would not have happened? You get it? That relationship is very, very important that you not miss that. So watch this, Okay. So assume with sincerity, the most fundamental factor in the relationship between the one who prays is the express, let me read it, assume with sincerity, the most fundamental factor is the relationship between the one who prays and the express will of God. Okay, let me say this other one and I'll talk about that. The only warrant for praying at all is that God commands it and desires it, and the only warrant for praying for some particular thing rather than the other is that God wills it. Um... <sighs> Pikachu, is that what that thing's called? Like a Pikachu, y'all know what that is? Y'all got grandkids? Y'all don't watch TV no more? I guess it's some Pokemon thing or something like that. The moment we got off the plane, that little girl, the smallest one, Pikachu, Pikachu, like what a Pikachu is. She said that thing so much that it didn't matter what Pikachu cost. Amen. She got her a Pikachu. Yeah. Now, she didn't blindly get a Pikachu. Grandma wanted her to have a Pikachu. 
because she had earned it. Kind of get what I'm saying? If grandma didn't want her to have a Pikachu, she could have been turning pink in the face. She could have shunned a halamalaka. She could have fasted. <laughs> sackcloth and ashes. Y'all get the point that I'm making? Guess what she wasn't going to get? A Pikachu. Yeah. And we need to understand that with prayer. Even though we may fool ourselves into thinking that we are the ones with the lamp in our hands and that we rub the lamp, it really doesn't work that way. God is in control. And if it's not the will of God that you and I have something, we need to submit it to God that his will takes precedence over our desires. You guys okay with that? See what I'm saying? Because theologically, a lot of us have fooled ourselves into thinking that we can mandate and demand God and press God. Come on, come on. Who's the parent here? You or God? Or who is God? You or God? You get what I'm saying? It must fit within his will for him answering prayer. Very, very important that we not miss that. So when I pray, I ought to be like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, it is not my desires, but your what? will be done. I, I've said this before over the years at Restoration Christian Fellowship. I'll say it again, then I'll stop. Lord, if, if, if my desire is less than what you have will for me, cancel my request and send your stuff. So I always submit my requests to the will of God. Very, very important that we not miss that, right? So, so here's what that means. You, if, for me to pray in the will, I need to know what the will of God is as it reveals in Scripture. Very, very, very important. Because here's why a lot of our prayers don't get answered. We just make stuff up. And then we try to make it Bible so it can sound spiritual as if God's going to change the pages just for you. This was written before the foundations of the earth. This was written before you came on the scene. He's not going to retroactively correct it and adjust it because of what you and I want in the earth realm. Does that make sense? Are you guys okay with me, right? So it is necessary, listen to this last one, to distinguish between what God has declared he will unfailingly grant and those things that he may grant, okay? So let me tell you what I mean by that. Let me, let me just get ahead to this. I want to get here real quick. Let me, let me just go to this one real quick, yeah. So in other words, here's what a lot of us do. God, I'm sowing a seed of faith. Y'all don't get offended, okay? And I, I want a million dollars, and I'm praying Next time they see your clothes getting raggedy and raggeder because it's got to look like sackcloth. you got to look spiritual. I'm praying for this blessing, and God's going to bless me. And God's sitting back saying, well, the last time I gave you a dollar, you didn't do the right thing with it. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? If it's not his will, does this make sense? Okay? He makes that call the same thing. I might be sick, and then I might be going through some things, and I'll be, Lord, you got to heal right now in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 blah. And maybe God wants to call me home. All my praying will do no good if it doesn't align with the will of God. Who knows what the sovereignty of God is? We don't know that. Does this make sense? Here's, I mean, a couple of biblical examples, right? Paul's thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians. Paul was, I got, he said, I had this thorn. I sought the Lord three times to take it away from me. And it, all three times, and, and it doesn't get more spiritual than Paul. Paul, God responded by saying, no. Why? Because my grace is what? So you got to be okay with the nose of God. Does this make sense? We have to be okay with that. Same thing with Bathsheba, right? And David with the birth of that child. David went down on his knees. He cried. He prayed. He, he sought the Lord. I mean, he didn't even go to war to say, God, don't let this child die. But then the child died anyway. And notice David's response. He got up like nothing had happened. And then he says what? If it's the Lord will, so be it. So here's, I want you all to take this away. I want you to take this away today. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. In a sense, prayer is educative for the believer. Not my will, but thine be done is the concern of the sincere petitioner. I'll explain that. So here's what prayer does for me. It teaches me the will of God for our lives. So I go to God relationally, and I let him tell me what his will is. I don't tell him what my plans are. 
Proverbs, many are plans of a person's hearts, but it's the Lord's will or desires that what prevails. So when I pray, and if God responds a certain way that's against how I prayed, here's the education. Hmm. He must have wanted that. All right, let's go there. Because that's what he wanted. Not, I ain't never going to church again. I'm done with you church folk. Ain't no God. Ain't no, 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 no. We miss it because once again, we don't understand prayer is about the relationship with God, with him telling us what he wants. And we align with him within the inside or those perimeters of the prayer. Last scripture, then I'm going to stop with this, right? Here's the scripture. I kind of put it up here so we can save time. James put it this way. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it's working. King James says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective, right? And I love verse 17. Eliza was a man with a nature like ours. I'm going to talk about that week. That's, that's very, so, so here's what the author is saying. Don't, don't make the mistake into thinking Elijah was nothing supernatural or spiritual. Or all. He was a person just like you and a person like me. But watch what his prayer did. He prayed fervently that it may not rain, might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore fruit. You want to talk about a relationship? Imagine, here's my landing. If as a ministry, we can humble ourselves and seek God face and pray and repent from the things that we have done, if Elijah could cause it to stop raining for three years and six months, and the author says there was no difference between Elijah and us. And what's deeper or better than us that Elijah didn't have is I have the Spirit of God. I wish I had somebody residing within me. If he could do that, if I can get my act together and get my prayer life together, imagine what can be done in our city. Imagine what can be done in our world. Imagine what can be done in our communities. Jesus said it this way, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed, cast into the sea, and the mountain must go. But we don't understand the power of prayer that is rooted in an intimate relationship with him. I can't just come up the street and come up in here. Hey, G, what's up? I know it's been a while, man, but I really need this right now. Doesn't work like that. Does not work like that. Does not work like that. Visualized Eden. God coming down. Hey, Adam, what's up, man? Hey, God. Let me tell you what Eve did today. Man, she, she hooked up the best vegetarian burger I've ever had. Really, Adam? Yes, God, it was just awesome. Can I have some? Man, I ate it all, you know. But I'm painting a picture of dialogue. Can you see yourself in relationship with God like that? That every second, every minute, it's you and him. Here's how he says it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But we live our lives as if he's not with us. The things we watch, the things we do, the things we say. Come on, think about it. Listen at what happened in the Garden of Eden. And how it began and what prayer looked like. That's what God is calling us for. You get it? That ought to be a 24-7. Hey, God, I'm about to go into this meeting. I need you to go before me and just tell me who's in there so I can know how to prepare. All the time. Not when you leave here. I left him in here. Doesn't work like that. If we can live like that. Acts 2, 42 to 47 is nothing compared to what God can do today. Here's how he says it in John 14, 12. The things you see me do, greater than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Bow your heads with me. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you're kind. Teach us to pray, God. Now I understand why your disciple says, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray because they saw the power of prayer. They saw the power of what can happen 
when a relationship is established with God. They saw that. And they wanted that. And God, we want that. That's when revival happens. When a church, a community, a people is in intimate relationship with you. That you come down in your transcendence and hang out with us. And talk to us. That's why Grandma them used to say in the old hymn, and he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. We want to feel that again, Lord. So God, forgive us. <sighs> forgive us. We repent. We humble ourselves. We turn from our wicked ways. And we want to seek your face again, God. We want to know you like that. The words of J.I. Packer, we want to know God. The fullness of who he is. So speak to us, God. Speak to us, God.